Good morning, Woolcrest. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm so glad to be able to open God's Word and share it with you today. This morning we are going to be concluding the Nehemiah team series where we are looking at different aspects of God's character and, uh, and looking at how the way we understand God impacts uh, our view and our, our efforts towards missions. And this morning, we are going to be examining God, our Savior. We're going to be looking at the God who is our Savior. Our passage this morning is going to be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And so if you would, stand with me, please. We will be reading the passage together, standing in honor of God's Word and to show our unity behind God's Word. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you with your word before us. Lord, and what a passage this is. I pray that as as we read your word, as we meditate on it, that your spirit will guide us, that you will teach us, or that you will show us the greatness of our Savior and how much we need him. Lord, I pray that all that is said today uh, would be in honor of you, We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so as we look at God as our Savior, and as we look at this passage in Ephesians 2, it begins with this great statement that we have been saved. And so if if you're reading along, one of the questions that should come to mind is, well, what have we been saved from? Right? The, the, the news that we've been saved is great, but, but what have we been saved from? And as it turns out, that is not an academic exercise. That's a question that's going to matter significantly. The reason for that is because the nature of the salvation that we need dictates the Savior that we seek. Let me say that again. The nature of the salvation that we need dictates the salvation that we seek. It dictates the Savior that we seek. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the office that I work at during the week, I'm usually one of the first people there and, well, usually one of the last to leave. So the start of my day is usually turning on lights and the end of my day is usually turning them off. And we have one office where by the end of the day, the light switch is hot. And um, it started getting hotter. And then one afternoon, I went in to turn off the lights, and I burned my hand on the switch. And it was discolored, and you could smell burning electrical. So um, who do you call? I'm sorry, say it again. You call an electrician, right? Because it's an electrical problem. So you call an electrician. These aren't hard, right? You you call an electrician. Now, different set of circumstances, like you're in your home, you're asleep, you wake up, and you smell smoke. You walk out in the hallway and there's flames. Well, first we get our kids out and our families out, but but who do you call? Yeah, you call the fire department, right? The nature of a fire demands a firefighter. Uh, Calling the electrician at this point, not gonna help. Too late for that. When you got a whole bunch of bugs in your house, who do you call? Okay, an exterminator, yeah. If it's enough bugs, you call a real estate agent. Um, (laughs) Unless it's spiders, and then we go back to the fire department. (laughs) Kill it with fire. Uh, But on a serious note, uh, if if we have determined that, that our ultimate need is for information, right, the fundamental problem that humans deal with is is ignorance, that if we could just know more and understand more, then we'd be better off. 
who are we likely to cry out to then? We may turn to educators. And I, I don't have a problem with education. I'm working diligently to make sure my kids get one. Um, but I am concerned that sometimes we take education to be not just important, but ultimate. Right? If we tell our kids that, that education is the key to a good life, then maybe we have on a practical level bought into this idea that, that the fundamental need is education. But it isn't. There are a lot of very well-educated people who are spending eternity apart from Christ. Right? Education is important, but it is not ultimate. In our culture, a lot of what we see as, as Christianity today is really self-help therapy. Uh, and so that makes sense if you think that the ultimate need for people is peace of mind. If you think that the problem is that we have regrets and we have anxieties and we need to work past those things, well, that would make sense that you would, you would turn to a therapist. And, and, and don't misunderstand. I think it's important for the church to help people with the issues they face. I mean, one of the highest privileges of ministry is when somebody says, hey, I've got a struggle, I've got an issue, and I would love to sit down and discuss this with you. We just have to make sure that we're not turning their focus inward to try to work out their own problems, but we turn our fo their focus to the Lord because he is the solution. But none of those problems are the ultimate problems. So what is the ultimate problem? Well, if we back up a few verses, Paul lays it out for us in the first three verses here of Ephesians 2. So let me read that, and we'll see what we are being saved from. The apostle writes, he says, And you were dead in your sins and trespasses, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of a mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. I know this is not a popular message, but I'll tell you what Paul says our ultimate problem is. It's sin. Our ultimate problem is sin, and sin brings judgment. It brings the wrath of God. Like I said, I know it's not popular, but stick with me. The good news isn't going to make sense unless you understand the bad news. Um, what this tells us is the problem is not that we need education and we don't need therapy. We need something that can answer the sin problem. We need a sinless sacrifice that will stand in our place and take the wrath of God for us. The Bible tells us that if we will put our faith in Christ, he is that sinless sacrifice that stands in our place and takes the wrath of God on our behalf. Now, I was explaining this passage to somebody uh, a while back, and they, they asked a really interesting question. And for a brief moment, I started to be offended, but it was a good question. He says, okay, so isn't this, if, if we're saying that what God is saving us from is his own wrath, then isn't God basically a mob boss? Right? The mob boss who comes to the business owner, hey, this is a very nice business. It'd be a shame if it burned to the ground. You know, for $500 a month, I can make sure my guys don't do that. Right? Both God and the mob boss are saying that if you do not comply, there's consequences. But why is this not the same thing? Well, the reason we get so upset with the mafia and, and the mob and all those guys, they're taking advantage of people who have done them no wrong. They're taking advantage of people who are innocent, right? The business owner is innocent with respect to the mob boss. We are not innocent before God. We are sinners. The thing that we forget is that we were rebels. We were born in rebel territory, and the moment we, we first could, we joined actively in the rebellion against God. And so his wrath 
and wrath is his right and proper response to sin, his wrath towards sinful people is right and justified. Now, the response to that is usually, okay, but (laughs) I mean, I'm not that bad, right? I mean, there's been times I wasn't proud of what I did, but I'm not that bad. Well, God speaks to that in 1 John. He tells us that we all need salvation. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Can I tell you that if your plan is to say that God is a liar, that's a bad plan. You need a new plan. We all are in need of salvation. And this is one of the reasons, well, we can't let people talk about having made mistakes, lapses in judgment, youthful indiscretions, right? We we try to sugarcoat all of this. And what it really is, is sin. It's rebellion against God, and it has invited his judgment. And so we need a Savior that can appease the wrath of this holy and just God. That's why I argue it's not narrow-minded to say there's only one way to the Father. I know the world tells us that's very narrow-minded, but if you can show me another sinless sacrifice that will step in your place and can take the wrath of God, I'm willing to listen. I just don't know of any. Jesus is the only one. He is our substitute who took our place and took our penalty. This is such an important idea. It's not just locked up in the New Testament. This idea is found throughout the Old Testament. Uh, I I want to give you just a few examples. Uh, When we start reading the Old Testament, looking for glimpses of our Savior, it's amazing how many places we will see him. I'm not talking allegories or or reading with special glasses on. Just There are pictures in the Old Testament of Christ. For example, at the very beginning, Adam and Eve, you remember in the garden, God tells them, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At which point they're like, which tree was that? Uh, God says, do not eat of that tree. And he tells them, if you eat of it, in the Hebrew he says, dying you will die. He's emphatic about it. And of course, Adam and Eve eat from the tree. They rebel. And God comes to them in the garden where they are hiding from him because that's going to work. And he finds them dressed in fig leaves, which I'm pretty sure is inadequate, right? And so he asks them, what have you done? Right? You remember the conversation. Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to? And then something amazing happens. In his mercy, God does not kill Adam and Eve. Instead, he kills an animal. And then in grace... He takes the skin of that animal and clothes their nakedness. He clothes their shame, covers their shame uh, with his sacrifice. Clearly, this is not on the basis of the works of Adam and Eve. They had just sinned. They had just committed the fall. If we move forward to Genesis 22, we see the same thing happen again. Adam, uh, Abraham and his son Isaac are heading up Mount Moriah. And you remember Isaac asking the question, Dad, I see the fire and the knife. I see the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God himself will provide the sacrifice. And you remember he binds Isaac and puts him on the altar. And at the last moment, as he's about to take Isaac's life, God stops him. And in mercy, he spares Isaac. And that's when they notice the ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And in grace, God gives them a sacrifice that can go on the altar in Isaac's place. He is the substitute for Isaac. One of my favorite examples of this is from Genesis 44. 
You remember the story. Uh, Joseph had 11 brothers, and they hated him, right? He had the dream they would all bow down to him, and then they hated him even more, and they sold him into slavery. And so Joseph ends up in the nation of Egypt and ends up going to prison. And God orchestrates some circumstances so that he ends up in prison. He interprets a couple of dreams, and a couple of years later, that's remembered, and he is brought out of the prison to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. You remember the story, there's going to be seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine, and you probably should get somebody in charge of that. And Pharaoh says, all right, you're that guy. And so he goes from being prisoner to prime minister in one day. That's impressive. And two years, or nine years later, right, he goes through the seven years of of plenty, and two years into the famine, his brothers show up. And they bow down before him, fulfilling the dream that God had revealed to him. And you remember, he sends them home because they don't have Benjamin with them. He sends them home to get Benjamin. And they come back, and in Genesis chapter 44, Joseph tests his brothers. He frames Benjamin, right? Puts a cup in his bag, makes it look like Benjamin stole from him, and he pronounces judgment. Benjamin is to become his slave. I think what he was doing at that point was, if his brothers haven't changed at all, They're probably given Benjamin as much grief as they gave him, and he can at least get Benjamin out of a bad situation. But then out of nowhere, Judah steps forward. And if you've been reading through Genesis, Judah is a mess, right? He has messed up by the numbers. But Judah steps forward and he says, can I have a word with you? He says, if you take my brother... It'll kill my dad. His life is bound up in the boy's life, and if you take him, you will kill my father. Take me instead. Put his punishment on me. Make me the slave. Allow me to be his substitute. And Joseph is so overwhelmed by that, he reveals himself to his brothers, right? The the, the, It's an amazing story. If you haven't read it, do it for your homework. Um, We see Judah step forward to be the substitute for his brother. And many, many years later, we see one more example of that. One of Judah's descendants, a young guy named David. His brothers are in the army. There's a war on, and he goes to visit his brothers at the front. And while he's there, Goliath struts out onto the field of battle taunting the armies of Israel. He wants representative combat, right? Send me a man to fight me, and if I defeat him, you are our slaves. But if he defeats me, we will be your slaves. Send me a man to fight with me. And most of the Israelites are examining the bottom of their foxholes at that point. But David steps out, walks down into the valley, and he kills the giant. And he wins a victory for all of the nation of Israel. Right? He wins a victory that is shared by everybody. And so, when we get to the New Testament, and we see Jesus as the culmination, the completion of all of these, uh, these events from the Old Testament, we see him going to the cross. He takes our place. He asks that the wrath of God be put on him. And Isaiah 53 says it pleased the Lord to crush him. He's the sacrifice that covers our sin and covers our shame, just like the one for Adam and Eve. He is the one who puts the cross on his back, walks up the hill of Calvary, and wins a victory for all of God's people. He is the sacrifice that provides grace for our salvation. And so... We see all of these pictures in the Old Testament. We see this fulfilled in the person of Christ. How does his sacrifice end up applied to us? Well, let's look at verses 8 through 8 and 9. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So the first thing to notice is the tense of the verb, or the voice of the verb, excuse me. It's passive. 
you have been saved, which is to say, you didn't do it. It was done for you. Sometimes if, if you think in terms of us being saved by works, you'll think that this is something we cooperate in. Salvation is not something that is done by you. It's not even primarily something done in you or done to you. It is something that is done for you. Which means when we are sharing our faith, we are not giving advice. We're not telling people what to do to get themselves cleaned up and acceptable before God. No, we're not giving advice. We're sharing news. We're letting people know the victory has already been won. Right? The price has already been paid. Salvation is presently available to you because of the work of Christ. And Paul tells us that that salvation is applied to us by grace. There's two ways that, that I think we look at this as being gracious. One is because the righteousness of Christ has been given to us. Let me, let me define a couple of terms. The difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is when you do not receive the punishment you have earned. Right? You are in line for punishment and don't receive it. That's mercy. Grace is when you receive the reward you did not earn. And the salvation that Christ gives us is of grace because he gives us his righteousness. And we did not earn that. Right? He at the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses in all scripture, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. He takes the penalty, or he takes our sin on himself and pays the penalty for it, but then graciously gives us his righteousness. And so when we stand before God, he sees the righteousness of Christ. But the second way this is gracious is because the Father accepts it, right? If I have committed a crime and I go before the judge and he assesses a huge fine, and I've got somebody who loves me who steps forward and says, I'll pay the fine for you, the judge can say, no, Adams did the crime, he's going to pay the fine. But you see, in, in Scripture, we learn that God has graciously allowed the benefit of Christ to be given to us. His, he has paid the penalty for our sin. He has given us righteousness. It is all by grace. That grace then is applied through faith. Faith here is believing God and his promises, believing in the work of Christ. It's the opposite of trying to earn it yourself. It's the opposite of trying to be your own savior. When we believe Christ is the Savior, when we believe that his work was done for us, then the word tells us that his sacrifice is applied to us. And then we see that salvation is a gift from God. It's given. It's not purchased. Sometimes we have this idea that I'll do my part and then God will give me salvation. You don't have a part. It's not something you can buy. It's not purchased. It's given. It's it's received. It's not earned. Now, if you'll let me, for just a moment, put my uh, grammar nerd hat on. Uh, If you look in verse 9, Greek, which is the language Paul was writing, is, is similar to Spanish. Right In Spanish, nouns have gender. And all of the adjectives and pronouns that describe that noun have to have the same gender. Greek's the same way. And in verse 8, grace and faith are both feminine. But as you move into the end of the verse, and he says, it is the gift of God, it is in the neuter, which means he's not talking about grace or faith when he says it is the gift of God. Rather, he's talking about salvation as a whole. Salvation from start to finish is the gift of God given to people. Our works then are explicitly excluded, right? Verse 9 says, this is not the result of works, so that no one can boast. There are two reasons our works have to be excluded from this. First of all, 
from back up in the beginning of chapter 2, we're dead in trespasses and sin. There is no work that fixes dead. There's no work that we can do that's going to, to somehow fix this situation. So apart from it being impossible for us to work for it, the second reason this has to be uh, based on God's gift and not our works, well, he says, this way no one can boast. If our works play a part in our salvation, who receives the glory for our works? We do. We can rightly boast about what we've done. And Paul says that's not happening. He says that our works are explicitly excluded. This is done by God. Therefore, God receives the glory for our salvation, not us. So we see that we've been saved from his wrath. We see that we have been saved by grace through faith as a gift, not because of our works, but because of his. So what did he save us for? Well, that's what, we, that, that's what verse 10 is all about. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. All right, so verse 10 says that we have been saved for good works in Christ Jesus. Right, when you say that you're saved by grace and not by works, the question usually comes, well, then do works have any place in the life of a believer? Yes, of course they do. That's what verse 10 says. They have a place in our life. They just don't have a place in our salvation. Right? Our works don't come, our good works don't come until after we're saved, right? He says that we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. That's Paul's way of saying in salvation. Right? Our works don't contribute to our salvation. They flow from it. He says that we have been saved for good works and that we should walk in them. Well, he says that this was planned beforehand by God. This is all part of his plan, that we would walk in these good works. It's an interesting uh, use of words there. Paul says that we should walk in good works. In Paul's day, where did you walk? Everywhere. What day of the week did you walk? Every day, right? Everywhere, every day, that's how you walk. Our good works are supposed to be the same thing. Everywhere, every day, we are to be involved in good works. Paul says that we are his workmanship. The idea there is a masterpiece. This is something God has worked at intricately. And so he has created us in Christ Jesus, this masterpiece for doing good works. So what are the good works? What are the good works that God has created us for? Well, if you read the rest of Ephesians 2, in the context of Ephesians, the primary good work he has created us for is racial reconciliation. Right? He goes through the rest of chapter 2 explaining how the power of God in the gospel is shown. See, up until this point, he's been talking about our justification and how God has saved us and changed us from being dead to being alive, from being earthly to being seated in the heavenlies. And these are all things that take place inside you that nobody can see. The rest of chapter 2 is showing how the gospel power in us is demonstrated to the world around us. And first and foremost, it's through racial reconciliation. Paul says, you want to know how I know the gospel works? I've got Jews and Gentiles seated together praising one Lord. That's unthinkable before Christ. Now, the distinction between Jew and Gentile was real. And it was a distinction put in place by God himself in the law. The distinctions between us are man-made. And the gospel is absolutely sufficient to overcome any differences that we have with each other. And so racial reconciliation is, is the starting place of our good works. This is the whole reason Wilcrest looks the way it does. Right? This is the biblical basis for a multi-ethnic ministry. 
The rest of these good works, I think you would have to say, is sharing the gospel, uh, and then I think living our lives to be that picture of Christ to other people. Our goodness is never going to be able to save someone else. But when we imitate our Savior, we open ourselves up to conversations about why are you doing this? And now we can talk about Christ and the work that he has done in our life and his goodness and his grace does save. So getting back to the Nehemiah teams, how does this impact our thoughts on missions? How does the fact that God is Savior impact how we do missions? Well, the good works that he has called us to expand his kingdom. And I think that we have to look at this. When we share the gospel, we're doing this for two reasons. This motivates us to share our faith. One, because we love God, we love Christ, and we want to praise him by telling his works to the people around us. And then secondly, we love the people around us. And there is only one Savior. There is only one way to the Father. And so we have to be sharing that message with them. So maybe you're here this morning and sharing your faith is scary. I want to challenge you to think some things through. Is Christ worthy of you having difficult conversations? Is the sacrifice that Christ made for you worthy of you talking to somebody when it's outside your comfort, your comfort zone? Right? Is he worthy? He is. I, I understand that sharing our faith can be scary, but I think our love for Christ must compel us to do so. Maybe you're here this morning and all of this sounds a little foreign to you. You don't know God as Savior. You just know that he's the judge. That too can be a scary and uncomfortable situation. And so I come with news. The judge is offering peace. The judge is offering terms of peace. Psalm 2 warns us that judgment is coming. And it tells us the only way to be saved from that judgment is to run to the judge. I know that sounds uh, non-intuitive, but to be saved from judgment, we run to the judge. And the good news is he is offering terms of peace. He is offering grace and mercy right now. That is why we call him God, our Savior. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning we offer you worship and our adoration because you are the God who has saved us. You have taken us from darkness and, and, and brought us into your marvelous light. And so we give you glory for that. And I pray that if there are those here who don't know you as Savior, that you would be moving in their hearts even now revealing yourself to them. Thank you, Father, for your love for us, demonstrated through the person and work of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. If you would stand with me, please. We're going to be having an invitation here. We're going to have some ministers at the front. If God is moving on your heart, want to know more about starting a relationship with him, we've got guys down here who would love to pray with you and talk you through that. Thank you.